English colonization begins with two brothers. They are Sir Humphrey Gilbert and his half-brother Sir Walter Raleigh. In 1578, Gilbert secured a royal patent, quote, to possess and hold and hold heathen and barbarous lands, countries, and territories not actually possessed of any Christian prince or people. A royal patent was basically a document that the the monarch of England would give to someone saying this gives you the power to go and take over a certain piece of property and this is your authority to do so. And what this is saying is essentially that the natives didn't have any hold over this. If they weren't if if a territory was not controlled by Christian prince or people, then it was fair game. And so this is the top, this is the patent that Gilbert it receives from Queen Elizabeth the first. It also guaranteed to Englishmen and their descendants in such a colony the rights and privileges of Englishmen, quote, in such like ample manner and form as if they were born and personally resided within our said realm of England, and laws had to be agreeable to the form of the laws and policies of England. In other words, what it was saying was that if you left London, for instance, and you came to the New World to start li living in a colony that was set up, you would still be considered as much of an Englishman in the New World as if you were still living back in London. There would be, there was to be no difference. You were not to be treated as a second-class citizen just because you had come to the New World. And the laws were supposed to be uh, essentially the same. They were supposed to kind of uh, go along with the form of all English laws. You weren't supposed to be treated differently simply because you had moved to a colony. Now, the colonists, as time goes by, are going to remember that, and the idea being that they're supposed to be treated fairly and equally as if they were still living back in England. Over time, this is going to kind of become a problem between the colonies in England because England will begin to look at these citizens, these people, as being second class and not quite the citizens of the people living within England itself. Gilbert sets out on a colonial expedition in 1583. He landed in Newfoundland, took possession of it for Elizabeth I, and then after losing his largest vessel, decided to return home with the remaining two. Probably um, it had too much baggage, too much uh, material in there. It may have been overweight. It's a little unclear. He could have gotten caught up in a storm, but in any case, um, his ship is going to be uh, wrecked, and he is not going to make it back to England. So, in 1584, 31-year-old Raleigh persuaded the king, the queen, rather, to renew Gilbert's patent in his own name, and his agents discovered swampy Roanoke Island, and Roanoke is in what is now North Carolina. And in the next year, Raleigh sent out his first ex expedition uh, to set up a colony, and this is going to fail. And then in 1587, Raleigh sponsored another colony of 117 people under Governor John White. The idea was they were going to send families this time and instead of single men, and maybe it would have a much better chance of surviving. White was a very talented artist. Uh, a lot of his paintings of the New World and drawings and sketches still exist, and you can go online and see those. He um, brought his son-in-law, his daughter, uh, over with him in this expedition, and his daughter, Eleanor Dare, is going to give birth to a little girl who is going to be named Virginia Dare, and she will become the first child born to English parents in the New World. Well, they, they had thought, on hearing word about Roanoke and the fact that it was on this swampy island, this swampy peninsula, they had decided that they would move to another t area uh, around the Chesapeake. But when they had come over and landed, the pilot of the ship said, No, I'm not going to go any further. I'm not taking you to the Chesapeake. 
Well, White had decided after a while that they were going to need to have more supplies. He, uh, they were, he was going to need to return to England and kind of report what was happening and the fact that they weren't moving and see if he could get more support from Raleigh. So he goes back to England. Well, he leaves behind the daughter, son-in-law, and his granddaughter. And the idea is that he would get back. You know, it probably would take a few months in those days with the travel there and back and having to report and get supplies. But what's going to happen is he's going to get caught up in a war that's taking place between Spain and England. And so Queen Elizabeth confiscates all the ships. And so there isn't any way for him to return to the New World. It's going to be three years before he's able to get back. And when he returns, he finds the settlement totally abandoned. There are, no there are no people living there, but he doesn't see any bodies. No message has been left except for one clue, the word Croatoan, which was carved on a doorpost. Now, this was a, the name of a friendly tribe of natives and also of their island nearby. Well, he was forced to leave by the captain of the ship that he was on. And so he wasn't able to get to that island to investigate to see if possibly there were survivors there. He's taken back to England and White is never able to return. And no one ever really knew for sure what happened to these people. It was unclear whether they died at the hands of the Spanish. Because remember, Spain and England were at, a, in, at war with one another. Were they killed by other Native Americans? Did they become part of the Croatoan tribe? We really do not know for certain, though some people tend to think that they did move to, uh, to that island and did join with that tribe. Uh, but in any case, this colony has become, over time, known as the Lost Colony of Roanoke, simply because we really do not know for sure. One thing that I want to mention that I failed to in the earlier in the earlier session about the conquest of the Western Hemisphere was the idea about germs. When the Spanish came and then the English and to this certain extent the French as well, all of these Europeans brought germs that the Native Americans had no immunity for. And so you began to have hundreds and then thousands of people becoming very ill and then dying, and nobody knew why this was happening. Now, the Europeans didn't understand it. They didn't realize that they were bringing these germs. Nobody knew anything about germs. This was not a deliberate thing on their part, but they were ultimately responsible for wiping out thousands upon thousands uh, of Native peoples. And so it helped uh, these Europeans... In their, in their attempt to conquer this area because you had so many of the native peoples becoming weak and ill and then dying from the disease, they didn't have the numbers to be able to fight back against these Europeans coming. So this is going to be part of the reason why the Europeans are able to come and take control over so much territory because of, this, because of the disease wiping these native peoples out. Uh, another thing, uh, as the English settle in and begin to establish colonies, you're going to have three primary type of colonies. These will be the royal, proprietary, and self-governing. Royal, obviously, are going to be controlled by the monarch. Self-governing is also kind of self-explanatory. Proprietary colonies are colonies that are going to be given to an individual or group of individuals by the monarch of England, uh, usually to pay off a debt uh, that the king or queen had come into, and so that they, in order to pay, pay that off, they would simply hand over um, uh, acres of land in the New World, and this would be established as a colony and ha simply handed over to this individual or group of individuals. Pennsylvania, for example, will be a proprietary colony. One other thing that I wanted to mention is about some of the labor that comes over. You're going to have a thing called indentured servitude. Uh, a lot of people will want to come and they won't really have the money to come. So what they will do, they will board ships, they will come to a colony, an English colony, 
and then when the ship lands, the captain will negotiate with someone and say, if you will pay for their passage over, then they're willing to sign a piece of paper in indentured servitude. They will then go into service or servitude with that person who's paid for their passage over, and they will have to work for anywhere from five to seven years to pay this off. They'll get room and board. Uh, sometimes people do it to learn a trade as well. Uh, often parents in one of these English colonies will actually put one of their children into servitude so that they can learn like a, a printing trade or how to do some other type of trade uh, to give them kind of a step up a profession when they're old enough to go out on their own. So indentured servitude was very much a part of life in these early English colonies and will actually continue for quite some time. And that's it for this session.